Ian Gatsby Force sucks. The fuck you talking about? Let's talk about that. Welcome back to Shoulda Boosted, episode number 21, and this one's going to be all about Aphyxius 4. Wow, this is a crazy model unit, and I brought on the perfect person to talk about it. Ian, how's it going? Great. I am so looking forward to talking about Gatsby 4. I have so many ideas with this guy. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, one of the things that we were uh, talking about is how back in CID, I ignored him because I thought like, oh, it's going to change. But whereas like from day one, you were in there teching for him, excited for him. And now I wish that I was on that ride with you because yeah, he's amazing. I'm so happy that he didn't change in any way from CID. The only thing that they did to play with him is that they changed his defense and armor and hitboxes. Other than that, he's exactly the same. Yeah, and it's, it's real good. So what we're going to be doing on this one here is we're going to start off just by giving you the base rules, just so you know what this guy actually is as we're talking about him. Uh, from then, there we're going to talk about all the different archetypes you could be building him into, and then a real deep dive into what those lists might actually be, and uh, the different lists that we're very excited to actually run him as. So to get into it, he's actually a unit. He has some little kill bots that comes with him. Uh, he can be taken in mercenaries, cricks, can convergence so lots of different places to take him and what he is then is like i said a unit where he's the model he has three little buddies that we'll get to he is uh, focus five speed six strength eight mat seven rat three defense 14 armor 17 command nine which actually matters since he's a model with the units uh, he has he is a construct, he has flying, and then a whole bunch of rules. Uh, the first of it being activate annihilation servitor. So much like Darius with the half jacks, at the end of your control phase, you can put one within two inches of him if you don't have three already. Uh, he's a battle group controller because he's a junior. There's leadership constructs, so that while within this model's command range, other friendly construct models gain bloodthirsty, so they get plus two movement when charging living models. Uh, they have a limited battle group, but I always love this phrase because it's completely the opposite of what it says, where they can basically be taking anything from convergence, cricks, or mercenaries in terms of warjacks. They just then all this count of whatever faction you're actually playing the list in, so lots of choices. Uh, there's malign al al alignment, and while this model's in play, models in its unit that are in formation and warjacks in the battle group all gain dark shroud. So holy crow, everything within, you know, base to base or within the, uh, what is this here? You get the minus two armor while you were actually within the range of it or the melee range. So that's just so, so good. Uh, the other part of it here is it also a warjack that is base to base to it. That's the part I was messing up there. Can also spend focus that's from it as well. So that's just so, so interesting. Uh, it also has Soul Taker called Soul. So it can be gaining souls from living enemy models destroyed within two inches of it. And they could turn that into focus. And then finally we're into things like its, its actual weapon. So it, it has a range 2 POW 16. But remember that it's basically 18 because of Dark Shroud. Um, that is so... Um, it's so greasy. This guy has focus 5. He can charge in and drop 6... Pow six, uh, pow eighteen attacks. Yeah, what the hell? I don't understand why why this is why this was allowed. Um, not only that, but he can that ability to have that call soul just as as you were talking on it. Mm -hmm. When he goes up from from focus five and he starts pulling souls for focus, he is a monster. Yeah, I'm wondering how much it's going to come in, opens. but when it does, that's going to be huge. Well, I keep going, and we can, and we'll jump to that um, because there's so many ways for him to get for him to get souls now. Yeah, 
All right, I'm going to skip over his little buddies for a second, and I'm going to go to his uh, spells. So he has Caustic Mist, which is a cost 2, uh, range control, AoE 3, and what it is, you place down an AoE 3 somewhere, and then it's a cloud, and also anything going into it gets the uh, continuous corrosion effect. So nice to make little clouds around it. Uh, it also has Flicker, which is a cost to self. And then you get to place all the, the, the models in this unit within two inches. So that can be okay. You can only do that once per turn, though. Uh, he also has Hellfire, which is a cost three, range 10, pal 14, where the model can't be making a tough test. And then it's removed from play. Uh, I also mentioned he has some little buddies that come around with him, the Annihilation Servitors. And these ones here are Speed 6, other stats don't really matter. Mat 5, uh, Defense 12, Armor 13, sure. I mean, they get hit, they die. The big thing here is that they have Dark Matrix, so if they kill a living enemy model, they send over the soul over to Aphyxius. They also have Murderous, so Mat 5 sucks, but when you're rolling an additional die to hit, it's not so bad. They're steady, which is sure, why not? But they also have the Murder Blades, which are 0.5 range, and they have the incise rule. Is that how you say that one? Yeah, it's incise. It, it's sort of, it's almost the exact same as Puncture, except they, PP decided just to throw a new rule out there and give them incise. Yeah, which is basically instead of making a damage roll, it just does one point of damage. I don't care if you're living, dead, whatever. It's just one point of damage all the time. Uh, super good for uh, for killing some shield wall infantry, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I thought would be a good place just to start is that let's imagine he doesn't have any spells, he doesn't have his little unit of dudes, he is just the stats in the fact that he comes around with his own five focus. For 14 points, if that was a heavy, am I not crazy in thinking I would take as many of, of those as I could? Instantly. So let's ignore all the extra rules that he has. He threats 11. He's POW 18. And if he charges with flight, so he can ignore all intervening models, he can hit somebody at POW 18 six times at mat 7. That's pretty good for 14 points. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start looking into his rules, however... Oh, let's look at the defensive benefits. Def 14, arm 17. Uh, if you're just sitting on five focus, you have to commit three heavies to him. If he's sitting on three focus, you have to commit two heavies to him. And I mean, a mat seven, pow 19 heavy going into him, uh, two heavies taking three swings each. It'll take six or we'll say you have to take six mat seven, pow 19 attacks into him with three focus and you have less than a 50% chance of killing him. Yeah. And I mean, we did, I don't think I mentioned this, but he only has 17 boxes. So, I mean, less than a heavy. But again, when you're reducing those things with focus, it that goes so far. And we're in a world of shield guards, especially in Convergence and Mercenaries. He makes his own clouds. Like, he is a tough model to kill. Well, I mean, even if we just start talking about how defensively teched he can be, if you you can hide behind forests, you can hide behind your clouds, you can hide behind whatever you want. You flicker forward, look, I'm in line of sight to charge. Yeah, exactly. Or if you want to, for some reason, be, disengage you or whatever you want. I mean, flicker on cane three was, eh, that's pretty awful compared to teleport on the other canes. But here, flicker can be really good. Flicker is amazing. It honestly is one of the, the, probably the best piece of tech on him because you just... If you have a caster that's like, oh, I'm going to stay out of his threat range, you charge something else, you flicker, you take your charge attack on it, then you flicker over onto your main target, and you're going to start chewing him apart. Mm -hmm. So maybe start talking about some of the different archetypes, and then we can go through those, and I can kind of get your thoughts on whether you think it's actually going to be viable or not. I think the first one we can look at, and remember, he is like a junior, so you have to take at least some jack with him. But what if we were to say we're going to run him as the super solo? We'll take whatever cheap jack we have to, just because we have to, and then otherwise, he is going in there. He is a frontline combat solo with his kill bot side by side. Uh, Ian, do you think that's a good archetype to run? And if so, wh why? I think that's second place to what he can, what he should be doing. 
Um, that that particular archetype, you can put a galvanizer on them for five points. I think that's the cheapest mo model that you can put onto them. Um, the next option is a six point uh, a six point light that is free um, through either Strange Bedfellows or Clockwork Legion. Um, you can get I think you can get six point solos or six point uh, lights for free in Strange Bedfellows, but I'm sure in Clockwork Legion you can get it. So you just throw a negator on him, or I wouldn't put a diffuser on him because he's only mat three, or sorry, rat three. Um, but yeah, like an easy uh, an easy choice is a free negator just to run it forward and to get the flank bonus for your other negators, and to ha have uh, dark shroud on a stick because dark shroud isn't he doesn't your actual battle group model doesn't have to be in your control range to keep the dark shroud. Oh, I missed that part. I thought it would have to be within control range. Nope. Your your murder bots have to be within your command range, but your actual uh, um, malign alignment, anything in your battle group, gain Dark Shroud. They don't have to be in formation. Uh, your models in the unit have to be in formation, but nothing else has to be in control range. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's yeah. They just rush off and do whatever they need. Yeah, you just run a, uh, a negator 14 inches into something, and you're like, oh, look, you're dark shrouded. Have fun. Yeah. I mean, in my mind, the whole combat solo thing is something he could do extremely well. Uh, something that people have been joking around is like, you know, take him with Shay, and then you could be putting on the spell on him that's making him even more crazy, a storm rager. Uh, but it seems to me like even though that would work and it'd be worth the points more than likely, it's almost like taking Nemo four without a unit with things to bring back. If you're not taking advantage of the other rules he has, it's like, ah, oh, I don't know if that's really the best thing to do, but I think it's still viable if that's the way you want to go. My favorite piece for him to take with him is a, uh, stalker. I, I think the stalker is the best way to go every single time. Move, it's advanced deploy. It has extended control range. It has power up, so you don't have to worry about allocating focus off of you like you do the convergence uh, models. It moves up. It leaps, does a couple uh, points of damage on something, and it uh, and it just gives you dark shroud within an inch. Yeah, I don't think it's a surprise or a coincidence, rather, that Mini Crate came out with their stalker version there at the same time Gas Before was coming out. So <laughs> exactly. So if that's the first archetype, which is frontline combat sh solo, the next one will be midline. And so probably with this, this is something where he's run with a heavy or maybe two and really trying to take more advantage of you can use all my focus and then I'm coming in more late game. What do you think of that archetype of like a midfield? I'm, you're using me as a, a focus battery. And then when that f uh, jack is gone, then he'll come in later. I think it's interesting. I think a couple of Slayers will work. Um, maybe a couple of Conservators. Conservators would probably be okay as well. The problem is that you still have to do that focus allocation with him. And it, using him, him as utility piece is a good method of thought, but I don't think you're maximizing exactly what he can do. Mm. It seems really nice that you can go and be in that midfield area and be like, hey, Toro or whatever, use all my focus after you do your stuff. But then he's sitting there with no focus. And I don't know if you can keep him alive unless it's in very particular situations. Def 14, I'm 17. I mean, you still got to swing a few times and you still have to hit. I mean, most heavies are mat six, mm -hmm. specialized ones, mat seven. You're still hitting on eights, and if you're boosting, you're not taking the swings that you need. And who knows what else is in the list there to protect it, right? So Exactly. So, uh, especially with Toros in, in mind, if you try and get a charge on Gaspy, you're going to get countercharged. Yeah, yeah, depending on how it's set up. So it seems like neither of us are really loving this whole midfield one, one type of version. But what about like more of a backfield type of support caster, where now you're probably taking, you know, two or more heavies, or maybe even a colossal. And so now you definitely have to play more conservative in the back so that you don't die and, you know, those things go inert. And then, of course, in just like the other one, he'll still be a beater late game. So what do you think about builds like that? I like that more than the midfield, actually. I like the fact that you can have uh, a blockader with um, access to six focus if he's base to base with them <laughs> with Dark Shroud. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is that if you're behind the blockader, like a huge base, then you're feeling pretty safe. Plus, I mean, that blockader can reach out four inches as well. So you can be, even though it can threat a far away, you can be pretty safe back. Exactly. And one of those big benefits are is that, again, you do that soul collection. And if he's at eight focus, do you want to see a blockade with eight focus pulling off of him? <laughs> yeah, it, it seems pretty crazy. It is a lot of points, though, right? Because absolutely, yeah. So I mean, that's what I found. Like when I first was looking at this, I was like, I'm going to take a blockader with him all the time. But one of the things that's nice with it as well is that if we're taking the blockader for the threat range, that whole leadership ability, it doesn't have to be in his battle group. That can be Magnus's. That can be anybody's uh, blockader. And as long as you're charging living and within command of Gatsby, off you go. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's it's so unreal for the potential damage that he can do on all three um, lines of engagement. Um, it's I don't understand how he made it through with some of these rules, but I'm so happy because of it. Um, that midfield role also to take into account that caustic mist. You put that out, and you and if somebody is forced to move through that, that is still corrosion that they have to be soaking through. Uh, I mean, you're you're not wrong, but I mean, the thing that does kind of throw it off for me is it's one of those things where if they're sending infantry through your clouds into your face, they're probably dying anyway. And I probably don't want to take the risk of like, oh, I'm not going to kill them because on a one or two, they might survive type thing. True. True. So I have one more extreme archetype before we move on to the, the next section, which is basically the opposite of the super solo. And that's the idea that instead of having nothing on him, you put everything on him. So basically you leave your caster open as much as possible. Let's say if it's a control caster, uh, so they want to be using their focus and not powering up jacks, and then you just give him a whole bunch of jacks. It's probably going to have to be convergence so you can get the whole... Uh, induction, induction going chain. through. Yeah. But what do you think about that archetype of just t lots of jacks? I think it's interesting because with con if you're doing a convergence caster, you can actually fuel up your um, your corollary and you can use the corollary's power, uh, power transfer to hand over to his battle group as long as you're not inducting it. If you do the full power transfer onto one of his jacks, he can induct it across that battle group, but he can't induct it back. Yeah. Um, uh, back to the other battle group. So he can do it and he can still be effective as the support. Plus, I mean, no matter what, he still has his massive threat range. It's it, he's a, he's a heavy, he's a caster killer and, but you can run everything on him. It's unreal. Um, I'm don't know if I'm a huge fan of the actual, uh, running everything on him to take the, uh, take the pain away from your main caster, only because I'm not a big fan of linchpins. I don't like the idea of having one single model that's going to hose me when he dies. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I know some people were thinking about, what's the new light that's the combat one? That's the negator. Yeah, um, like something like, you know, like five negators on them or something like that, where not only do they have flank with each other, but they have dark shroud as well. I have looked at builds that have three of them on him, but... That's not even close to like putting everything on him. That's only 18 points, and you can actually get them for free in some builds. Yeah, good point. So I, I think that's the main archetype. Do you have an archetype in mind that that doesn't really cover? Nope, you pretty much covered everything. Uh, however, I just want to refocus on the one that the one that I think is his strength. So which one do you think is the number one out of all those then? Number one, go up and kill the enemy caster in any way that you want. So the super solo or that's the super solo. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, just on his own, he threats with the spells and everything. He threats 13 inches. That's with a place effect, uh, either before or after charge movement. He can fly. So he doesn't have to worry about pathfinder. 13 inches of nonlinear threat is really really good and six swings or four swings four power 18 swings will kill a lot of casters and that's assuming charging living right no that's that's speed six three oh. inches for for the charge two inch threat uh that's 11 and uh plus two inches for flicker that's just 13 on his own he doesn't get leadership constructs to himself 
Oh, that's right. That'd be other constructs around him, eh? Yeah. Okay, so fair enough. The idea for him is that you just run his uh, his little dudes wherever you want uh, to apply Dark Shroud, and then he goes in for the main kill. Yeah, and I've seen some builds with that where it's really the assassination with him, and then also things like, say, with... Uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, McBain, where you can just pop the feet on him and be like, all right, he's super tough. And I'm just literally flying him into your face because I just don't care. If you don't Grievous, you're not going to kill him. And then you can't get away from him type thing. But, yeah, then you're dead next turn. Yeah. So I think we're going to get into the the list next. But I think one of the things I want to do first is I've been, I know, I, 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 I could feel the jank bubbling up with you. And you just want to talk about all the different synergies this guy has. Do you want to go on about some of your favorite things and favorite synergies with him before we get into some list ideas? Uh, there's mainly just two casters that I have primarily been looking at him with. And that's Lucant and Aurora One. Only two, hey? Those are the two main ones that I that I have really put a lot of effort and time and thought into, and I feel that he is maximized in those two particular builds, in the builds that I uh, in the usage that I'm going to use him with. Um, Lucant, he's really good with him. He's friendly faction. He gives Dark Shroud out. You can. Uh, he gives. Uh, and I'm assuming everybody knows that when you run Lucan, you generally don't run Battle Group. You run Clockwork Legion because it's so good. He's mm-hmm. so synergistic with him. So if you run uh, Gatsby uh, with Lucan and you put positive charge onto one of Gatsby's uh, jacks, so we can assume either Stalker or Negator, he's getting positive charge wherever he's going. So he's POW 20. Yeah. Matt 9. So he's going to hit, he's going to hit whatever he wants and he's going to hurt whatever he wants. And then not only that, but he is giving the, all the, the clockwork legion models. So reciprocators, um, uh, all the medium bases, giving all, all the infantry plus two inches of threat with bloodthirst. It's so good. You have, uh, reciprocators threading, I think it's 14 inches. So there's speed five, go up to eight, two inch reach. 12 inches for uh, with Bloodthirst, and then 2 inch, uh, yeah, 12 inches with, with him alone. And 12 inch threat on those guys is real good, and they're going to be POW 18 when they're swinging. Mm. I know Sorry. Uh, two of the yeah. synergies that I've been really loving is the fact that I no longer need to worry about taking a unit to score zones because that's going to be a unit. Plus, I don't feel like I need to take Ragman anymore because I already have the Dark Shroud anyway. That's kind of where I'm looking at because there's a couple method of thoughts for my other caster that I'm looking at, and he brings a lot of dark shroud. He brings four or five sources of dark shroud minimum. Uh, on top of that, when you're running him with Lucan, Lucan's Clockwork Legion list is very slow uh, and is susceptible to rough terrain uh, and all kinds of situations like that. He flies. You can fly one of his bots over in to contest his own in behind a building or get him into his own. And they have to go after him. They have to commit resources, too. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering how much I should be expecting from those murder bots and, you know, how much it's going to be helping out or getting in the way. I mean, it's one of those things where I think I'm just focusing on Gatsby. I'm not really thinking so much of what those bots can do. But, I mean, they can run out and contest. They can block charge lanes. They can do whatever. And, I mean, you don't want to take a free strike from one of these things because it's rolling four dice to hit and you're just taking a point. So infantry just die. But do you see a lot of jank with the unit as well or mainly just with Gatsby? If you can get that unit killing stuff the turn before he goes in, you are going to do da- so much damage. That's three souls. You're pulling three souls onto, onto yourself. That's three focus. He's an eight focus caster next turn. If you have eight focus on him, he's going to be hitting everything and he's going to be hurting everything that's within two inches, four inches of him if you save your flicker for the right moment. Yeah. Do you think there's any use in taking an arc node with him? Uh, I see the corner cases for Hellfire... But outside of that, I don't see enough use for it. Um, yeah, it, if you if you really need him 
to go throw to go pumpkin and corporeal or to kill a, a tough model i think you might be trading down at that moment and you might be trying to play catch up mm -hmm. and on uh, that note like what are like your favorite jack loadouts right now like what do you think are the best packages to take with him uh in clockwork legions uh it's either stalker or three negators because I, I think they threat pretty well with him. I, they threat 12 and a half inches. They have a three inch repo. You can get them wherever you need. And they take a little bit of effort to kill. Um, but the stalker is the, what wins almost every single time for me. Uh, it being able to threat so far and get exactly where you need to uh, without getting countercharged or things like that um, with the place effect and bring Grievous Moons with you. It's, it's in my opinion, the clear winner in it. Are you ever tempted to take any of the Merc Jacks over there? I looked at them. Uh, I thought there was some some cute things, but I think that they're just, in comparison to what the Stalker offers, I think it's point inefficient. Really? Okay, fair enough. I mean, I mean can... that's that's a play style. That's a per like a person to person thing. You're a far better Merc player than I am. You know the the Merc's faction far better than I do. But out of looking at his entire list of options, I. think think that i think the stalker is pretty much the, the winner in my heart hmm. yeah I, I definitely like the stalker idea uh but i mean i also definitely like the idea of taking the the toros with him if you're really trying to cheap out i suppose you could go with nomads or something and even just like we were saying like that blockader idea i, I just think that there's some real potential there and I, I don't know about all the others. The one that I've been really wondering about is the canker worm. And uh, I know, you know, we talked about in the chat, but for me, you would never just take the canker worm as the one. But if you were running two jacks, you might take one Toro that you can then run midline and make the Toro make all the attacks with your, your focus. And then you have that canker worm that can go in there with the armor pierce that I think POW 15 and then repo to wherever else you want Dark Shroud as well. So what do you think about the canker Canker worm with him. I looked very, very closely at canker worm, and I think there's a lot of merit with that. However, the major issue that I have with the with canker worm primarily is it with my second build that I haven't started talking about yet, which I'm probably going to like gush over. <laughs> is it overlaps a lot on what that particular caster does, and that's my Aurora one list. And I've just, I think. It's one point more than a stalker, but it, and it still has AD. Um, it has parry. It has stealth. It's a construct. Uh, it has that five-inch repo bond. But again, I think the stalker wins out on mobility and placement effects. The right. bite's amazing, though. I have I have to give it that one. Like having a having a POW thirteen uh, armor piercing bite, boosting that. Well, it it gives me a lot of joy, but I don't know if it's enough to take me away from the stalker fair enough all right i think i've had you bottled up long enough please tell me about your aurora one list in jank oh uh, okay so there's two different builds for it the first one is aurora with the corollary a diffuser and either um a second diffuser and a conservator which is the floaty blade fist one or three negators uh, Nemo 4 with a Firefly, Hermit, and then this is where I start going in even further into the CID. The new solo Prefect Hypatia is the one that gives leadership apparition to angels and is a speed 7 flying weapon master. That's uh, pretty good. Two Void Archons, three groups of the new angels that are coming out next month, assuming that we actually get them, thanks COVID. Yeah. Um, which have uh, crit paralyze on their guns, but they also have straight paralyze on their weapons. Now, they also have gangs. So they're Mat 8, POW, four, uh, POW 14, paralyze attack. That's real good, and especially with the Asphyxius, if you need to hit a caster and you want to go for that super solo kill, that kind of helps out quite a bit. So the idea behind it is that Aurora has a speed buff called Aerogenesis. You get plus two inches of movement. She also has Arcane Might. Now, if you're running Nemo, you drop um, one of the Iron Heads, which allow you to place uh, 
Gatsby 4 up 2 inches. And then you have uh, Aurora Pop Aerogenesis, which gives Gatsby an extra 2 inches of movement. I think just to explain one thing there before you get too far. So this is being run as a mercenary bedfellows list, and this is why you can drop the the Iron Head, right? Oh yes, it is. It's a okay. mercenary's. Uh, it's a mercenary's strange bedfellows list. Apologize about that. So the whole the way the whole mechanism works is that Aurora goes, she uh, casts Aerogenesis and pops feet and upkeeps Arcane Might. A unit of angels go in, uh, charges the. Uh, um, charges the caster or whatever you're trying to kill, paralyzes it, and then uh, they repo out of the way for, for Gatsby to go in. Meanwhile, the hermit moves up seven inches because it's flying, and then repos five after it pops a ruin. And if you actually kill something within five inches of him, he moves an additional three. So he has 20 inches of effective master of ruin. Uh that's pretty when crazy. These keep, yeah, it's it's really gross. I think that's the best hermit build. Like Aurora One Strange Bedfellows with Hermit is the best hermit. I can't think of anyone else that does it better other than maybe Ron. Ron can smite him forward, can chain smite him forward and place him and, and do all kinds of crazy stuff with him. It's that's but that's a whole other dis, uh, discussion. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, you have Asphyxius threading 17 and a half inches between the iron head. Aerogenesis and his own personal flicker. Yeah, that's pretty intense. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> the last step is that if you do get a diffuser shot, which I mean, this is a super telegraph move, but if you can get a diffuser shot, that's 19 inches of threat. You put a he- like, you should go and shoot a, a huge base, and he gets 19 inch, uh, 17 inches of charge threat. Whoa! And he's parry, and he's flying. Oh yeah, there's like there's just no stopping it. He just flies over and gets to wherever he needs needs to get to, and then he's hitting whatever he wants. If it's paralyzed, they're set defense five, um, and it's POW twenties with Hermit, and he gets to use Arcane Might off of Aurora for boosting all of his damage rolls. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, I know. You could probably be fully camped and still stand no chance. I don't. I think. I think Fury casters might be able to survive it, but yeah, maybe, it's yeah, only going to take a couple swings to, to if you have like if you burn through transfers, you, even if you throw him away. There's seven; they have seven transfers, and you throw out Gatsby, he's going to be killing a couple of heavies just through the transfers. Oh, and absolutely. the bleed over the bleed over might be worth it. Like if you take out three heavies through uh, through through those um, through those transfer attacks, it's going to be like the average dice is going to be dice plus four. With boosted, so you're going to be rolling 15s, so you're two heading heavies potentially. And even then, you know, they're down a couple of heavies, and they still have to kill this Gatsby so that they don't just die next turn, right? So Exactly. And that's that's a single unit of angels, a hermit, uh, Nemo 4 dropping the iron head, which is going to be turn 1. You're like, this is a turn 2, turn 3 kill. Mm-hmm. You have to either bottle up um, and defend against the assassination run, because... Or you hide behind some forests and you have to hide there the entire game when you're getting out threaded. You either give up scenario or you give up your caster. Yeah. I know you've been doing some stuff on Vassal, I think. Have you had a chance to try out this list? I have not had a chance to try out this list. This is all theory right now. Um, I am I am super crushed at this moment because of COVID. Uh, I want to play this list to its full effect so bad. It is what is getting me through right now through this pandemic is looking forward to playing this list and awesome paired beside it. And it could be till September. It could be a while. <laughs> if it has to be, it has to be, it'll get me through this entire thing. You're going to find the first person to get sick in our gaming group. And you're going to be like, okay, cough on me. We got to get games. Let's get this over with. I was joking with my wife today about having a, uh, once this, once the, all the curve flattens down about having uh, and th- again, all of you don't get angry. It's only a joke about having a, a, like a chicken pox party, except it's a COVID party. So all of us get sick and then we can all start gaming again. <laughs> yeah. Send that hate mail to the community killer. <laughs> Please do. I love the attention and I will entertain all of you and all the trolling. I am thicker skin than, than most internet celebrities. 
<laughs> uh, anything you else want to add about what your list can do, or do you want me to cover what my thought was? Uh, the well, the the other thought was that I don't run the Firefly with um, with Nemo, and I run a Dynamo instead, and I drop the two Void Archons, which gives me a ridiculously hard hitting, long threading uh, Dynamo missile into somebody's Colossal or uh, something like that. I mean, Dynamo is a different conversation. Or I mean, not Dynamo, but um, Nemo is a different conversation. But he does a lot. And he kind of synergizes with the rest of the list really well. The list is looks like a hodgepodge of models that just got thrown together. And it's a lot of moving parts. I think it's going to be a difficult list to pilot when I do get it running. Mm. The other thing like too is that how fast you can bring back things like the kill bots because you're going to have the, the one recursion coming from Gatsby and then the D3 coming from uh, Nemo 4 as well. So there actually is you know some significant recursion there. So even though if you don't have a lot of models, you can be sacrificing them knowing that they're going to come back. Uh, can you do... Oh yeah, they are grunts. So you can do that. I thought it was living that you could only bring... that you can fold space with. But yeah, no, that works really well. Like if you just bring one back and then fold them up. Nice. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so to me, the way that I really like Gatsby was not so much the assassination, but more so the support. I mean, coming from a mercenary side... We don't really have a lot of juniors. We have the one, and he's okay-ish. And so when I'm looking at things like Magnus, who don't want to be spending all their focus because of how often he gets shot in the face, Gatsby's perfect to be paired with him, especially when I'd be threatening further. I mean, I already have a threat 14 blockader with Escort. Now it's threat 16 if I see anything living I can get at. So in my mind, it'd be something more like mercenaries or regulars. And I like the fact that our two lists that were coming up could actually be a pairing. So if you ever want to oh go my to God. yeah, do like the episode 21 pairing. You got it right there now. We should We should make this a thing. We just bring three casters between the two of us. And then just swap out lists between, just be like, I need that tray. You take yeah. this tray. We could do it. Yeah. Uh, but this one here would be Magnus running a blockader, two Toros. Uh, then the package with Gatsby right now is Gatsby with two Nomads. Uh, the reason why those aren't Toros is just because of the points. points? But again, if yeah. I do the whole canker worm thing, then I can be changing that up. I still have Iris in there, Anastasia, Widget, and then to get rid of some infantry, I have Harlow and Orin. So the idea in this list here is, you know, I, I got five heavies, really six heavies when we're talking about Gatsby as well. And so that really allows me to go in with a massive alpha with blockader, lock you down with the feet. And then on the next turn, the Toros are going in, the Nomads are going in. One of the Nomads is probably doing a bunch of hits through using the focus of Gatsby and then looking past that into the more late game you know then it's just no holes barred Gatsby just doing whatever he can to do work all over the place and the part that I love in there too is again those clouds where how do I lose games with Magnus I get shot in the face but if all of a sudden I have some clouds now that I can put in front of me during that setup that's just all win 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 and like I said before now in my list where I'd start off with some Kayazi to score zones and I'd be having Regman to actually help me break armor well, that's built in, so I don't need to do those things anymore. Yeah, because how many points is Ragman and, a, and two units of Kayazi? Uh, the Kayazi are five points each, and then Ragman's four. So that's like your 14 points right that's there. That's 14 points. That's a perfect, perfect changeup. Just as a heads up, Malign Alignment doesn't work in command. Gatsby has to be base-to-base -base with, uh, with the jack that you're spending his focus off of. Yeah, I don't think that'll be an issue. I mean, it might be. Uh, I mean, the thing is, that I'll, I'll be in there with the blockader and the Toros and the Nomads. So I, with like an iron wall, I should be able to basically run up Gatsby to wherever I need him. And then the Nomad goes in and just buy attack, buy attack, buy attack, right? Gatsby goes where Gatsby wants. That's a, it's, it's so good. I, I don't understand. Like, if my biggest fear about him going through CID and to live was that he was going to lose leadership constructs bloodthirst that is if he would have if they would have got rid of that i he would have been useless i think he would have been borderline useless that plus two inches is godly 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I thought he was going to get worse in some way. He just seemed so overtuned. And really, the only big negative I saw was that they fixed the thing where you could just, like, run one of his drones because it didn't have to be in command at first. But, yeah, he just kept everything. And so he's just value town. There's so much there. Yeah. And, like, there was some other little play, like little nuances I was playing with some lists, like... Um, having the the three little murder bots, like once everything's jammed in, using him as an attrition piece, and having the three little murder bots go in, kill, kill, kill for some souls, and then having my Signar battle group go in and kill, kill, kill for some more souls, because I have a soul trapper in that list. Mm. Soul trapper picks up souls, goes and pitches them back onto Gatsby, and now I have a focus 11 um, Gatsby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I forgot one more synergy with my Magnus list. I have bullet dodger and guess what? That's going to go on. So now oh. I'll be a defense 16. And if you ever miss With me, dodge. I dodge to wherever I want. I don't even think that you need it on them. Like if you're three camping, like if all you're doing is casting flicker, or if you're casting out a cloud, a focus three Gatsby, you need to commit a heavy and your trait and you're going to have to commit almost two heavies to kill them at a 50% rate. Hmm. Like I said, Matt seven, Matt seven heavy, uh, or seven six Matt seven pow nineteen attacks is a fifty percent chance to kill on Gatsby with a three camp. Yeah. That's just fine. That's just fine to me. He's so defensive. So here's another thing I was wondering what you thought is that in a way you could almost kind of see him as like a jackhammer caster because of how that whole piece works and normally if you are running a, a, a jackhammer caster and I know you've run one and I've run one you usually want some sort of knockdown just to really make sure you can hit I mean I suppose you don't need to because you go to Matt a billion but do you feel that with Gatsby you want to be filling in some knockdown outs so that you can actually go and you know make sure that whenever you're buying those things off Gatsby you're getting the full value um in in what way can you so You're what I mean by that is that, let's say in this example here, I could very easily go in with that Mat 6 Nomad and miss a lot of critical attacks, and all of a sudden my Gatsby sitting on nothing because I all tried to fish, you know, 8s or whatever I needed to hit with my Nomad if it's a, a Warp Wolf or who knows what it is, right? Like, Mat 6 sucks. So if you put in something that can knock down, you know, and there's so many different options, Buccaneer, uh, Steelhead, uh, Cannon, whatever you want to be putting in there to knock something down. Now it's a straight up value. You know, it's going to hit. Do you find that's important here or not really? To to kill something with Gatsby or? To knock something to down so that you can kill it with basically that jackhammer ability. Uh I don't think it's really that necessary because most of the most of the, the things that you're hitting with, yeah, they're Matt six, but you're gonna be going after heavies with as most of his targets, and you're gonna be looking at defense tens, defense elevens for the most part. Unless you start looking for slayers, then yeah, I would probably be looking at boosting. Mm. Um I don't know but, I don't know 100% on that one because I've been looking at paralyzes. So I guess I do have to agree with it. Yeah, fair enough. And I guess that's even just for Gatsby. Not even if you're not going to be doing that jackhammer thing, the, the alignment, you know, just for him to hit. Matt Seven's good, but it's not always enough. Yeah. I mean, Matt Seven is kind of on the on the line of being good. It's It's good. It's not great, but you'll hit. Do you think you'd want to be investing in some sort of range jack that has knockdown? I don't even know if we have one available. Yeah, mitigator can do it if you want to put it on Gatsby really bad. But oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, mitigator will do it. I mean, and Mercs have lots that have the ability to do it. Um, you you can look at. I mean, if you're looking at strange bedfellows, you ha you can crit fish with uh, Nemo. Um, you can uh, put in what's the the one with the quake cannon. Um, from Signar. Yeah, but that one can't be on him because he can't take Signar oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, but then again, uh, I guess we don't want to take that Convergence one because then it'd be Rat 3. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, yeah, exactly. And you have to directly hit with it. Yeah, so it's be for something yeah. else. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about the mercenary casters to tell you. <laughs> that's that's my issue. I mean, you could put a, a, a inverter in there with the seismic hammer. Good, yeah. Just to make sure yeah, something uh, gets knocked down. Yeah, and it's a POW 20. Oh, actually, it'll be a POW 22. 
One of the ones um, I was looking at was a Toro, oh, not a Toro, a Talon, because what the Talon has is that it has stationary on its spear. So if you're going up against some war jack, it would stationary it. But then again, that's only war jacks, and typically war jacks don't have that high defense. It'd only be if it's one of those like you know Signar-ish type defense twelve ones, or defense. I think the Slayers are thirteen, aren't they? Uh, I suppose, and of course, we're living in a world of Morrowind Archons and stuff, so these things can be even higher. Yeah, that's that's where we kind of start looking at the meta and, and checking for particular pieces. Uh, Morrowind Archons. Mm. They're so, way too good. I mean, that's a good seg- segue, because the next thing I want to talk about is the weakness of Zagas before. You know, when you're building him, when you're trying to figure out what to drop it against, what are you not wanting to drop him against? Uh... Probably is anything with backlash. Backlash will ruin his day real bad um, because you just got to get your hands on that one jack that he's going to have and just ruin him with it. Unfortunately, he plays just like a regular caster. He is just as tough as any other caster, if not a little bit tougher, other than the focus pool. Um, but realistically, he can hide pretty well. I don't think there's too many casters that I'm really, really worried about. Yeah, he, he does have a lot of protection. Uh, my thoughts is, you know, it, depending on where you're talk, taking him and how many shield guards you have, I mean, if you do have shield guards, someone might like Sloan might just kill him regardless, right? And so depending on how far you invest, that could be a bigger and bigger issue. And so that's kind of my thing is that when I looked at the different archetypes that we started with, he becomes, of course, a larger, larger liability the more things he has on him. So, and then also, of course, anything that you're looking at that has really strong shooting, you know, like even like tridents, if there's a couple of tridents, they might be able to get it done if you're not careful type thing. So I think it's going to be, I bet you at the beginning, you'll see a lot of aggressive Gatsby players going in there, spending a lot of their focus and then just getting shot down. But then once they're starting to play smarter, it's going to be harder and harder to kill them. Yeah, I think in my opinion, he needs to play super cagey for the first two turns and that's when you start pulling the linchpin out and getting him exactly where he needs to be. On the trident route, yeah, I mean, everything dies to tridents, though. Because whatever cast you're running with, and I play two tridents with Assyria all the time, you'll kill heavies with them. You'll kill way above their points with them, just because of the way they work. Uh, now, but, here was the other thought I had, though, is that if you're worried about a range takeout of Gatsby... I was thinking about this thing when it first came up with Nemo 4. It's like, oh, I wonder if I drop against Sloan, how easy it is to take out. But then I realized if they have the range power to take out your Gatsby 4 or your Nemo 4, they could also just kill your caster. So I bet you that's actually never going to occur that this great amount of Sloan shooting kills off this super junior. They'll probably just kill your caster. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, when you start talking about the Sloan, the Sloan matchups, I mean, usually you're going to be dropping your other list. If you have something like Sloan, you're going to be dropping your off list that's teched for that particular situation. I mean, I have my off list specifically for that, which is Ostrom, and Sloan doesn't want to see Ostrom <laughs> at all. No. <laughs> However... That might push Sloan out of the pairing and into their off list, which is just fine. So you get that little bit of list chicken, but I mean, some players don't want to see that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess getting into the, our little end step here before we, we end up the pad cost, was there anything else, any like jank or craziness or synergies with Gatsby that we didn't get to? I think we pretty much covered it all. He's a great midfield support caster for certain builds, particularly anything with either a large battle group or a large amount of constructs. He is an assassination monster and he needs to be sitting in the front third of the table to get what he needs to done. Um, I guess it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how players utilize him and in particular, how they allocate points to his battle group. Primarily, that will tell you how a cast, how a player is going to be using that caster. Um, if they're running him lean, expect an assassination. If they're going to be running him heavy, expect him to be sitting behind a forest and, and biding his time for the second for the crackback. Um, past that, I think that's pretty much we pretty much covered most of it. 
Now, the, maybe the last thing that I was just wanting to quiz you on is that if if you were a random person and looking at your theme and saw that you're in a theme and a faction that gas before is allowed in, would you? What situations would you not take them? Uh, so if I'm a random person and I'm trying to figure out ways not to take gas before, uh, if I'm running convergence and I'm running heavy battle group, I probably wouldn't run him with lock. I probably wouldn't run him with the with any of the jackhammer casters. Because he's taking away what they already do best. And that's crack armor. If you already have ways to crack armor and you already have massive threat ranges, it doesn't really need to be there. You can go on your other list. See, I, I'm kind of of a, a different mind with it. That, say, when I look at Nemo 4, there's some certain times where I could be taking him, but if I don't want to have that ranged element, I don't think I'd want him. It seems to me that when it comes to Gatsby 4, if it's ever available to me, he's so much v- value that I want to do it regardless. Even ones that want to be running a big battle group, it's still worth running you know, some of those points over there and just focusing on something else on the other side that I, I'm really challenged trying to find some times that I would not want to take them. Yeah, I just look at um, like my skew list, like my off list is awesome. And I, it's, you can still want to have your balance between your pairings. And I think he doesn't fit into everything perfectly. I think you still need to be able to skew over. Otherwise, you're diluting yourself too much to get hit with another skew yeah fair enough all right well i think we're drawing to the end here so ian thank you very much for joining uh before we stop though we give you a slight little plug but do you want to plug your stuff uh i am also known as the community killer uh i am on facebook if you want to get a hold of me uh you can get me there you can get me hate mail you can pop in there and ask me questions about gatsby or strange bedfellows I play Convergence, I play uh, Convergence and Retribution, and starting Mercenaries now. Um, so if you guys want to dojo or get in touch with me or maybe do an article together, by all means, get in touch. I'd be more than happy to chat. And you're going to be organizing that COVID party too, right? Uh, not confirmed yet. <laughs> all right, awesome. All right, so otherwise, thanks to everyone to listening, and we'll catch you later. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you.